Boker Tov, good morning. I want to thank our sponsors for the year for the Amuna series, although there still is the opportunity to sponsor each individual shear. Thank you to Dr. Zavi and Bella Morgan, who sponsored Leila Nishmas, Rabbi Dr. Brian Gavit, Baruch Tzvi Ben Ruvay Nassan. Today uh, we'll be celebrating a beautiful Siam here in South Florida, joining with Jews around the world. The Siam Hashas of the Dafyomi. It's all dedicated in memory of our South Florida Siam, in memory of Brian as well. His neshama should have a huge aliyah. We are finishing the booklet, the packet that's in front of you today, which represents this uh, series of prakim we've been learning together in Ravolba's Tzadik Be'emunaso Yechia. The idea that we actually find life, we live life when we live with emuna. You can be dead even while you're alive. Oops. You can be alive even while you are, even while you're dead. And the way that we achieve life, the way we achieve immortality, is by living with a sense of emuna. When our life is informed and animated by the presence of Hashem, by a feeling of mission-driven life, by having purpose in our lives, by finding meaning in our lives, by um, conceding that there's someone bigger and greater than us in our lives, by not having too much pride or arrogance, but recognizing that we're not independent, but we depend on Him. When a person lives life that way, they're living a life in high definition. If a person lives life without God, then in fact they're dead even while they're alive. They're not even in black and white. It's off altogether. That to be alive, a person has to be uh, connected to Hashem. We said yesterday in the Parsha class, in our Parsha, when Yehuda confronts Yosef and he's recounting their whole exchange and the whole episode that led them to that point, Yehuda says to Yosef, that if he will, he says, when you demanded that Benjamin be brought down here, Yehuda tells Yosef, I told you, our father is inconsolable, our father is devastated, our father's already broken, he's lost one child, and if you make us bring the second child, aviv, if he abandons his father, vames, he will die. So the simple understanding is who will die? His father, Yaakov. Yaakov has lost one child, and if you make us bring Binyamin, and he potentially loses a second child, he will surely die, he cannot survive, he will never endure. However, others suggest that we read it differently. Vyazav Aviv means that if you leave your father, Vames, the child, the child who disconnects from his father, the child who's living a life as if they're independent, born of immaculate conception, as if they've appeared in this world out of nowhere, responsible for everything in their own success in their own life, Vames, such a person is dead even while they're alive. That Avinu Shabbat we have a father in heaven. And the degree to which we attach ourselves to him, we're alive. We're alive means to truly have life. You can, we've been learning that you can understand that in the simplest sense is if you want to live a life of serenity and calm and tranquility, if you want physical well-being, spiritual, emotional well-being, the more you submit to a higher power, the more that you recognize you don't have control but relinquish the control to Him, we take our own initiative, but we balance the initiative with trust and faith in Him, then we're alive. All the studies show that the more that you believe and the more you let go, the better your health and wellness, the better your emotional well-being, the better your relationships. The less you let go and the more you hold on, the more arrogant and the more controlling and the more envious and the more angry and the more all of this will uh, disconnect you from people around you and certainly to the Almighty Himself. So if we abandon our father, we cannot survive. What gives us, I'm going to speak later this morning, if I have time to finish writing it. But I'll speak later this morning about how Torah is ensured that connection and our survival throughout the ages. It's really extraordinary. I'm going to mention a few stories. But throughout the worst atrocities and the worst systematic attempts to exterminate us and the darkest and bleakest times, what nourished and nurtured the Jewish soul and what kept the Jewish people alive was Torah, was Torah. We're seeing what happens when you abandon Torah. The levels of assimilation and intermarriage in this country and in our world as damaging and devastating as the rise of anti-Semitism, what's lost in the conversation is how much it pales in comparison, statistically, to the annihilation we're doing to ourselves. If a person is truly disturbed by anti-Semites' aggressive attitude to try to destroy the Jewish people, then we should be moved to fight the destruction of the Jewish people by doing outreach and by getting involved and not seeing our own demise. We're killing ourselves at a much faster rate and in a much more egregious fashion than anti-Semites could ever be successful. 
We are taking care of ourselves in this country. Anti-Semites should feel free to sit back and watch. They don't even need to do their work because we tragically are doing it for them. So we should be moved to realize that there's a world of Jews out there who don't feel Hashem, don't see Him, don't know Him, who don't have access to our sacred Torah, don't understand its timeless messages, don't realize that to be alive means for the Jewish people to be alive and vibrant and have a bright future, we have to be connected to God, not only in abstract or theory, not only in the shul or the base medrash, but as you've heard me speak about a lot lately, in our homes and in our daily lives and in our conversations and in our value system. It has to permeate our entire being. It has to be who we are and how we behave and how we carry ourselves if we want to secure the future, the continuity, the life and the living of the Jewish people going for forward. So tzaddik be'amunaso yechia. We're in the second paragraph of pay, page pay Ches, and Revolba has just dealt with the following question. We all know the story. We ended with this last week. We know the story that God is in the middle of visiting Avram. Avram has had surgery, no anesthesia, at an adult age. He's on the third day of recovery, which is the most painful day. He's sitting outside of his tent. Why is he outside of his tent? He should be convalescing and recuperating in his bed, at home, drinking milkshakes. Why is he binge-watching Netflix? Why is he outside of his tent? Because for Avram Avinu, it was more painful to think that he was not going to be helping others than it would be to be recovering from surgery with no anesthesia. So he's outside of his tent, desperate and eager and waiting to be able to be hospitable. That is, for him, the best medicine. The greatest medicine for Avram Avinu is not Percocet or Oxycodone or it wasn't anesthesia. The best medicine and painkiller for Avram Avinu is being hospitable, is caring about others, is being selfless. So God comes to visit him, and in that way he's a model for us, a model of Bikr Cholim. We have a responsibility to visit the sick, to try to take away some of their pain. That when we are pay company to the sick, we take away a portion of their, of their pain. There's a doctor, Dr. Jerome Groupman, happens to be Mishpacha, a cousin of my father-in-law, but he's also a world-famous New York Times best-selling author, doctor, physician, Harvard Medical School professor, writer. He's written many, many best-selling books. And in one of those books, he tells the story about a, a woman who he, whom he had been treating. And uh, who, she was in the hospital and her health was failing. And he came to the conclusion that there was nothing more that he could do. So he tells the story that he came to visit her late in the day when there wouldn't be the hustle and bustle of the hospital, which is also a message of Bikr Cholim and when we schedule to do it, not when it's convenient for us, but when it's best for the person that we're visiting. And he goes and he sits by her bedside, he holds her hand, he's an unusual doctor in that sense, his level of, of, um, of, of personal concern and connection, commitment. And he makes small talk and he says, I need to tell you something. And he, say, he writes that he hears from the quiver in her voice that she knows exactly what he's about to say. But he says it nonetheless. And he says to her, you know, we've done this and we've done that, and I've always been honest and a straight shooter with you, and I have to tell you that unfortunately, I don't think there's any more medicine, there's no more treatments that we can give. We've run it, we've come to the end of the line. And she paused and she cried, and she looks at him and she squeezes his hand a little tighter and she says, there is one more medicine you can give me, it's the medicine of friendship. It's the medicine of friendship. And he writes in the book that he realized then that in addition to all of the chemicals and biologics and all the medicines and all the treatments that we give, but camaraderie, companionship, the friendship that we give literally relieves pain and suffering. It makes a person know they're not alone. We're no say but all, we carry the burden, making it a little bit lighter for the other person. And, and hopefully that gives them the strength to be able to go through. The truth is that he was anticipating a Gemara. The Gemara says that when you visit a sick person, you take away 60th of their illness. So you'll ask, well, why don't we just get 60 people to visit them, and then we can make them all better. But it doesn't work that way. The math doesn't work that way. But when you visit somebody, and, and again, the research and studies, you can Google it if you don't believe or trust me, but they show that as well, that the degree to which a person feels they have companionship and camaraderie, it takes away part of their pain. I once called Dr. David Pelkowitz with a very, very <laughs> difficult question I had to deal with, a very <laughs> difficult question. And he is, you know, the great psychologist and uh, professor and teacher and role model for so many of us in so many ways. So he said to me, he goes, Rav Ephraim, that's a difficult question. And I don't know what to tell you. I don't have an answer. But I'll tell you this, he said. He said, studies show that if a person is trying to climb a mountain, if they're by themselves, it feels extremely steep. And the degree to which they have other people around them, the mountain feels less steep when they climb it. Physically, literally. So he says, I don't have a good answer for you but I want you to know I'm here to climb the mountain with you. So it feels a little less steep. And it was, it was a great answer. It was humble of him, first of all. I don't have the right answer. But I want you to know you're not alone. So when we visit someone who's sick, 
What we're telling them is, we hope we're making the mountain that you need to climb, the mountain that's in front of you, we're hopefully making it a little more shallow, a little less steep. So Kodesh Baruch Hu comes to visit Avram Avinu, he comes to pay Bikr Cholim, and we emulate his way by visiting the sick ourselves. And what is Avram's reaction? He sees these three angels, they're walking in the guise of men. Oh, finally his chance, hospitality, he's going to welcome them in, cook for them, take care of them. And he says to Hashem, if you don't mind, could you give me a minute? Could you wait? I'll be right back. I've got to take care of them. And what does God say? I would think I would say, Mechutzef, low life. You're talking to me. I'm the source of all, the king of kings, the infinite, the omnipotent, the divine. And you're going to neglect me and walk away from me and put me on hold to take a call from someone else? Are you kidding me? But what does God do instead? He says, Shkoyach, you give me pride. You did the right thing. So asks Revolba, why did God have to create that conflict to begin with? If he sent these angels, if they're really just emissaries of his, why didn't he send them when he was done with the visit? Why did he create the conflict to begin with? And Revolba writes, again, this is what we ended with last time, is that Kodesh Baruch wanted to test Avram. And he wanted to see whether Avram would understand that to believe in God doesn't just mean in concept, in concept, in theory, in abstract. To believe in God is not a phys- philosophical conclusion. Belief in God must filter down and translate into becoming a godly personality. We all know and we're terribly disturbed. I constantly am talking to people who are turned off to Judaism or to Orthodoxy because of people who supposedly are very religious but don't act very righteous. Now, in many or most of the cases of the people who are turned off, they've already been turned off or they're looking for the cop out or the excuse and that's a convenient one. If they were really looking in the mirror, honestly evaluating the issue for themselves, I go to the gym and the trainer I find eating a donut in the corner, so I'm gonna not go to the gym? I mean, I'm going to punish myself and not work out because the trainer who's been lecturing me about nutrition and diet, I find him in the corner, I find him in the, in the parking lot in the back of Dunkin' Donuts eating a whole dozen donuts. And therefore, I'm going to get even with him by saying, I'm not going to the gym anymore and I'm not eating healthy. That's just foolish. It's foolish. Yes, it's disturbing. And yes, it's duplicitous and hypocritical. And yes, it's a turnoff. But so what? In the end, we're not doing it for anyone else. We're doing it because it's true and it's right and it's for ourselves. And yet, it is such a turnoff, including to me. When I interact with supposedly religious people and they're not righteous people, I wonder what's the point of religion? Where is all their religion? That's the message God was sending out from. You believe in me and you talk to me and you claim to love me can't just be philosophical, conceptual. It can't be external. It has to filter down to molding and shaping who you are. So I'm sending you three angels while you're talking to me. And let's see, are you going to shuckle harder, have a longer Shemun Esri talking to me? Or are you going to stop and say, oh, there's people who need help. I've got to help them. What's more important, to talk to God or to be like God? The greatest testament of loving God is willingness to even interrupt your conversation and audience with Him to go and to be like Him. We would all be happy for our children to hang up on us because they have to go do a chesed for their sibling. If they say, can I call you back because one of my brothers or sisters are calling and they need something, I want to help them. You, would, you wouldn't say, chutzpah, I'm the parent. I'm all of your parent. To take care of one of my other children, you're going to hang up on me? Chutzpah. You'd never say that. You'd say, nachas, nachas. That's the greatest joy there is. So that's what, Avram, that's what a Kodesh Baruch Hu set up. And that's the message Revolba is concluding this entire section we've been studying with. That belief and faith in God translates into midos. If we want to improve our character, we don't improve our character and then find God. Find God. And finding God should mean and must mean being better, becoming better, improving our character. Avram interrupts his meeting with God, his rendezvous with the divine, and he asks God to wait for him. Don't go. Don't leave. I'll be back in a minute. He doesn't say, look, God, good talk, good talk. What do they, what do they call it? DMC, the kids today. DMC. I told you, did, you didn't do your homework. You're supposed to call your grandchildren and say, let's have a DMC. You'll blow them away. You'll make them so excited. Did they love it? How excited were they? A DMC, a deep, meaningful, you don't have kids at home. Here. A deep, oh, you do have kids at home. That's Layla, DMC, deep, meaningful conversation. It is a deep meaning. I had to get a whole vocabulary. I had to post a glossary to my refrigerator to be able to talk to my kids today. I don't know what they're talking about. Flex and DMC and this, and I don't know what they're talking about. All right, that's another class. But anyway, so 
Could, so God, uh, Avram doesn't say to him, God, good DMC, good deep meaningful conversation, gotta go, we'll pick it up another time. He says, could you wait here? Wait here, I'll be back. And he taught us a very, very important principle that being like God is even better, more important, a higher priority than talking to God. Being like God is a higher priority than talking to God. So the person who walks around all day, the person who tells you, with God's help and please God and thank God, and then they're a jerk. They're obnoxious. They're mean. They're insensitive. They're, ca- they're callous. They're cruel. They don't really believe in God. You cannot claim to believe in God and love God and not be like God. That's Rav Volba's message to us. If we believe in him, if we love him, if we worship him, if we, if we uh, submit to him, then we are committed to be like him. So we saw in this case that Avram says, I've discovered God. Oh, that means I've got to go be hospitable to these three nomads who need my help. Revolba points out, who does Avram interrupt the conversation with God to welcome? Three distinguished Rabbanim with long beards and long black coats? Three righteous women who art scroll books are written about their unparalleled chesed? Is that who Avram is stopping to welcome, interrupting his conversation with God to have in his home? Who is he inviting into his home? Three idolaters from his perspective. Pagans. People who have so little in common with him. But you know what they have in common with him? Everything. It's called humanity. They're other people and they need him. So he stops what he's doing, and he goes, and he concerns himself with them, with them. So the Rav in Pesach wrote a beautiful essay about the Siyam Hashas. 100,000 people are gathering in MetLife today. We have a fraction of that gathering down here, but people gather around the world. He wrote a beautiful essay about, the, I forgot if he called it New Year's resolutions, but the commitments, the preparation we should be making for the Daf Yomi, Siyam Hashas. And one of them was, don't forget, the non-Jewish security guards and personnel and staff that today is their New Year's and their day off. Don't forget to thank them and acknowledge that they're, that they're working on their day off so that we could celebrate our Torah. Humanity, we connect to humanity, we care about humanity, we're children of God, we're at Selim Elohim. So to love God is to be like God. So yeah, you know, we, have, we, we are God's eldest children. You're not supposed to love your oldest child more than your oldest children. So we are B'ni B'chori Yisrael, we have the status of being God's oldest child. But God loves his other children Okay, not as much, but he loves his other children. <laughs> he loves his other children. And we have to love our siblings too. However much we have in common, or no matter the differences. Nasa Adam Bitsalmenu Kid Musainu. The Pasuk says, when God creates the world, he turns and he says, Let us make man in our image. The fact that there is godliness in us means that we have the ability to find God. You see, I, maybe this is arrogant or obnoxious, but even the people who claim to me to not believe in God, I don't believe them, they don't believe in God. I think every Jew in their kishkas, in their core, ha- knows that Selim Elohim inside them. There are layers and layers and layers of baggage, layers of hurt, layers of not wanting to make a change, layers of all kinds of things that are barriers to the person being in contact with the true truth that's buried deep inside them, the pintal yid. As much as there's air in their lungs and a beat in their heart, as much as we are alive and animated, it's because we have a tzelem elokim inside us. And we can no more deny that than we can deny who our parents are or that we were born to, to people. That tzelem elokim is inside us. It's what we know to be true, that we come from something much bigger and much greater than ourselves. That Tzalem Elokim, by the way, is the source of the obligation of Yehavta Lorecha Kamocha. I have to love my neighbor like myself. Why? What if my neighbor is not lovable? There are non-lovable people. There are unlovable people in this world. Uh, Don't start thinking of who they are in your life. (laughs) I know right now that's where you all went, especially if they're members of your family. Don't think about the unlovable people, but there are people who are kimat, they feel practically unlovable. So if you look at the end of that Pasuk, we have to love God. Why? Ani Hashem. Why does the Pasuk end? Love your neighbor like yourself, I am God. Okay, nice to meet you, God. I'm pretty sure we know each other. We've had this introduction several times. Why are you reminding us here in this context? And the commentators explain very simply. 
God says, hi, I'm God. I set up the whole world. I created all people. And there's a piece of me in everyone. And the reason that you can and must love everyone is because there is something redeemable and lovable in everyone. And how do I know that, says God? Because on Yashem, there's a piece of me in everyone. And to the degree to which you declare someone unlovable, and the degree to which you cannot find anything to love is an act of heresy. You're actually denying God. You're not just denying the other person because you're denying the godliness in the other person. Everyone. It might be very hard to find. It might take a scavenger hunt and a research crew, an archaeologist, and it might take an enormous effort to find anything lovable or redeemable in some people, but everyone has it in them. And that's how Vavtarecha Kamocha is go find it. Go search and find something redeemable, something lovable, in what way they are, at Selim Elohim, they are an embodiment of God. Because to love other people is to love the godliness in them. And to declare someone unlovable is to deny that God is in every one of us. It's true about how our relationship with ourselves, we often talk about. We have a relationship with other people, we have a relationship with God, but most important and most neglected is the relationship we have, bein Adam la'atzma, with ourselves. We are in a world of people who don't love themselves, who don't forgive themselves, who don't give themselves the benefit of the doubt or let themselves off the hook or don't move past the mistakes they've made. There, there's a world of people who love themselves too much. We know such people too. There's a high correlation between the unlovables and those who love themselves too much. But, not for now, but as much as there's a world of people who are unlovable, there are people who don't love themselves. And we're seeing the consequences of people who don't love themselves. Mental health and depression and anxiety, suicidal ideation, because there are people who think that they're not lovable. There are people who don't realize that there's a Tzalem Elohim inside themselves that they have godliness and a godly soul and a godly spirit and they need to nourish and nurture it and bring it out to light that fire as we spoke about last week and fan that flame until it burns bright, until it burns bright. So when we get to Kid Musenu, Nasa Adam Bitsameinu, God said, let us make man in our image. Kid Musenu, let him be like us. So God here has revealed his whole purpose of creating the world. He created the world for us to not only know he exists and have a relationship with him, but significantly to be like him. So emuna must translate. Emuna cannot just be, I tell the world and I preach to the world and I lecture the world about how I found God. I found God, then I cut corners in business, then I'm a ruthless competitor. I cut corners, then I'm un- insensitive and unkind. I don't leave nice tips. I don't hold the door. I don't say please and thank you. I, I, I'm abusive to my spouse and children and I'm controlling and manipulative. If you're doing all those things, stop saying you love God. You don't know God. Because if you knew God, you would want to know the God in you and you would never be like that. To know God is not only to love God, to know God is to want to be like God. Imitation is the highest form of flattery. If we want to flatter and love God, then it means a commitment to be like Him. And so you'll say, well, my genetics and my predispositions is just not who I am or how I can be. I live a life where I get angry easily or I'm jealous all the time or I struggle with arrogance or I, or I, or I, I'm just that person. It's not true. Go back to that word na'ase adam. When God said na'ase, let us make man, he said it in the plural. Why did he say it in the plural? To whom was God talking? There was no one else. He created a world, and true, it's the sixth day of creation. To whom is God addressing when he says na'ase adam? So the Ramban Nachmanidi says that he's addressing the earth and everything he had created on the first six days. He's looking at the earth and the vegetation and the heavens and the animals, and he says, nu, na'ase adam, nu, earth, world, I put you all in place, I built you all, now it's time, let us make man, because that's why you're all here, to serve him. So let's go, let's make it happen. He turns to the Mother Earth and he says, you have the ingredients, let's gather up some clay, and nasa adam, we're gonna make man. The Arachayim HaKadr says, that though Hashem created the entire world and everything in it, he's using the royal we, in order to model a sense of humility. God is the source of everything. He doesn't need anyone's advice. He doesn't have to say we. It's the royal we. Let us make man. He probably said it with a British accent. Let us make man. Na'asa Adam. Na'asa Adam. Let us make man. Because he was modeling humility for us. Rashi says Na'asa, third explanation. It's teaching us a very fundamental lesson. No matter how smart you are, no matter how good you are, no matter how great you are, always confer, consult with those less than you. Because God is turning to the angels and saying, Na'asa, no? You want to help me? You want to partner with me? What's your feedback? I'm interested in your opinion. And God was modeling for us that God is perfect, omnipotent, and infinite. He doesn't need anyone else's opinion, and he certainly doesn't need anyone else's help. And yet, he said, Na'asa Adam, because he was modeling for us an attitude of humility. So these are all beautiful, four different ideas 
about three different ideas about what Nasa means. But the Zohar's definition of Nasa is the most powerful to me. Says the Zohar, Nasa Adam B'tzamenu, you know who God was talking to? He was talking to every one of us. Nasa, nu, together, let us make you together. I'll mix the ingredients and I'll implant the neshama and now you go live your life and you mold and shape your character. Nasa, let's partner in making you. Don't be fatalistic and don't say it's predetermined and don't say that I'm predisposed and don't say this is just who I am. Nasa, Nasa Adam, that we have that capacity to do it together. When did we accept that invitation? In partnership, God says, let's make you together. When did we accept it? Where else does that word Nasa appear? So the Medrash connects the two and says, when we stood at the base of that mountain and God said, I'd like to give you the Torah, and we said, Nasa Venishma. That Nasa, okay, I accept the invitation. I'm in. God invited us, let us make man, let's do this together, let's be a unit. And we accepted the invitation when we said, Nasa Venishma. So don't be fatalistic. And don't assume it's who you are. And don't say, I'm just impatient, or I get angry easily, or I get jealous easily. Okay, maybe you do. That doesn't mean that you can't accept the invitation to be a partner to conquer that and to mold that and to shape that. So Zachinu, the final paragraph. Zachinu lahaven madua Torah herich ab mavinu. We've merited to understand now why the Torah goes on and on about this quality of chesed of Avram. Ki heim abitu ladargas ha'emunah shelo. So this entire section that we've been studying together, Revolba has developed the idea. Amuna and good character go hand in hand. If you have Amuna in Hashem, it's not that if I have good character, oh, I'm a good person, I'm a good character, I'm going to study Torah, now I'll find Hashem. Find Hashem and it should lead you to want to mold and shape and have a better, and have a better character, to be, to be better people who we are. Have less anger in your life, Realize you're not in control and the world doesn't have to conform to the way you want it to be. There's a higher power. Submit to God and you'll get angry less often. Envy? Realize that there's a God who gives you everything that you need and everything that's right for you and take initiative and ask Him for more. But don't be jealous and envious and petty with your friend why you should have it and they shouldn't. Because whatever God gives each person, if you submit to the higher power, you're not going to have envy. You won't have anger. You won't have envy. You won't have arrogance. You won't... The midos will improve by working and exercising on the emuna. We usually think work on the midos, emuna will improve. It's the opposite of the revolba. Work on the emuna, work on feeling Hashem's presence in our life. And when you're about to react with anger, when you're about to fly into a fit of rage, when you're about to look with a jealous eye, when you're about to swell with an arrogant heart, when you're about to stop yourself, when you're about to panic with anxiety, say, one second, I go to this class Wednesday mornings. <laughs> I've been going for years, not just for the coffee, for the jolt of Amuna, and I forgot. Don't get angry. Don't be envious. Don't panic and get anxious. It literally can transform our lives by working on that Amuna, that knowledge that Hashem is in our life. We will see the results, the positive outcome and results, please God, will be measurable in our lives. Sorry for the abridged class today, but have a seat we've got to get to. Wishing everyone a great day.